So as mentioned before, I finished the course at the Breathe Institute. And in this video, I wanted to talk about what are the causes of craniofacial abnormalities. I also want to say what I am saying now is not a reflection of what the Breathe Institute says. There are things that I might be inferring or saying incorrectly, so there's definitely going to be at least some discrepancy, so keep that in mind. I'm not, I'm not speaking on their behalf. So craniofacial abnormalities are a modern disorder. There might be genetic predispositions, but they're largely not genetic. They're actually caused by modern factors. That's right. That means that primitive humans did not have these issues, at least not anywhere to the extent that we have these issues. These causes are in no particular order. One of the first causes is a reduction in the frequency and duration of breastfeeding. So breastfeeding is really important for childhood development for multiple reasons. Uh, one of those reasons being craniofacial development. So I'm not exactly sure how, but something about the baby sucking on the nipple encourages the face and the skull to develop correctly. Unfortunately, that's really all I can say about that one. But the next modern cause is chewing soft foods. It's the invention of cooking. Throughout human evolution, humans used to chew on really hard, tough, raw foods often, such as raw meat and raw vegetables and nuts and potatoes and whatever. And also a lot of fruits and vegetables were less calorically dense, so they would have to eat a lot more of it. And that meant that humans, uh, I've heard, I forgot where I read this, but were chewing on tough foods upwards of four hours a day and even children. So that chewing and chewing and chewing uh, exerts forces that push the face outward so you develop a healthy wide smile and also exerts a lot of force on the roof of the mouth uh, by way of the tongue pushing food around. You develop good muscle tone and the face develops well. It just that's just how evolution works. If there was something that always was, then it never needed to be changed. The human body is just not robust enough to work perfectly when the conditions change under the conditions of evolution. And that's really true for everything, not just life. So that leads me into the last cause, which is nasal congestion and low resting tongue posture. This is caused by the invention of the building. Like I'm in right now, buildings, whether you're allergic to par specific particles or not, capture a lot of airborne particles. A lot more are prevalent inside than outside because as air comes in, the particles may settle and there just naturally becomes more and more and more, especially when you start to introduce introduce all these knickknacks and clothes and linens that produce more and more airborne particles. Even if you're not allergic to it, you might be sensitive to it. I've never tested positive for any allergies. Maybe I still have allergies, but at the very least, I probably am sensitive to high densities of airborne particles, which can trigger my nasal congestion. My sinuses will swell. And I remember this problem happening all the time as a kid. And we all just thought it was, oh, that sucks. It's uncomfortable, whatever. But it turns out that, you know, when you cannot breathe through your nose, you breathe through your mouth. And when you breathe through your mouth, you will drop the tongue to the bottom of the mouth. I mentioned in a previous video why it's important to have correct tongue posture for adults. But now I want to explain why it's important for children. So the healthy human, and especially child, is going to have their mouth closed, they're going to be breathing through the nose, and they're going to have the tongue in proper resting tongue posture up on the roof of their mouth. As I explained in a previous video, if you have the tongue on the roof of your mouth, you cannot breathe through the mouth, meaning that if you have nasal congestion, you need to breathe through your mouth, then you need to drop the tongue. So you drop the tongue, you breathe through the mouth, which by the way is unhealthy for other reasons too, more than just craniofacial development, breathing through the mouth leads to other 
inflammatory issues that maybe I'll talk about in another video. But if not, I think this is this book I'm reading now, Breath by James Nestor. It's not a very scientific book, but I think it's really interesting anyway and talks about a lot of these topics. So anyway, why do children need to have the tongue on the roof of their mouth? So your tongue acts as a scaffolding. You have it on the roof of your mouth and as a child it's lightly pressing the maxilla apart, lightly pressing the teeth apart um, and prevents the jaw from growing inward and makes sure you have that wide healthy smile. So those are the three reasons. So what's going to happen if your jaw grows inward? So I talked previously about how you have might have tongue tie, you might have low tongue space, those can lead to sleep disordered breathing. Uh, I talked about fascial restrictions in a previous video where um, it can lead to postural issues by having a tight fascia buckling your posture and buckling your skeleton. Interestingly, uh, there's another phenomenon is that if your jaws grow inward, especially if your maxilla grows inward, it's also going to grow upward. This is called a high arched palate. And not only does this make it even harder for your tongue to rest properly on the roof of your mouth, but uh, it also, as your palate becomes more arched and grows more upward, it might grow too much upward. Now, what's gonna happen then? Can you guess? In a previous video, I talked about how the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. So if the roof of the mouth grows up too high, it's gonna intrude on the floor of the nose. And uh, you might have heard of this term a lot, deviated septum. If you haven't, a septum is basically a small wall that separates your two nostrils so air can flow through them independently. A deviated septum is when there is some curve or spur in that septum. Well, this is why that happens. When you have a high arch palate, it buckles the septum, which leads to more problems with nasal breathing, which as I talked about in another video, leads to more problems with the Venturi effect. And nasal breathing also then encourages further mouth breathing. These things are a cycle. Here's that cycle. Uh, you have low resting tongue posture, postural maladaption, you get those skeletal changes that leads to further limited tongue space. Then you get dysfunctional oral myofascial compensation. So these compensations might be the way you swallow, you might thrust your tongue forward or mouth breathing is considered another compensation. And then that further reduces your limited tongue mobility and so on. And then there's obviously other factors that aren't explained such as the whole nasal breathing kind of um, you know, septal issues. I also wanted to bring this cycle to people's attention. This is the Guillemino musculoskeletal hypothesis. I don't remember if I talked about Dr. Guillemino before, but he was the pioneer of sleep research, especially in sleep disordered breathing. Uh, he discovered sleep apnea, he discovered UARS, um, he made some amazing contributions to humanity, and he had this hypothesis. You have mouth breathing leads to local inflammation. Uh, let me explain a little bit why mouth breathing doesn't have a proper gaseous exchange. When you breathe through your nose, air is filtered through the sinuses. All other gases such as nitric oxide are produced, which are then goes into your lungs. I guess that's a good thing. If you don't have these factors, it's going to lead to certain local inflammation. This might further tonsillar enlargement and soft tissue enlargement which then worsens uh, nasal breathing and upper airway resi resistance and then starts causing abnormal facial growth, postural issues, systemic inflammation, um, and so on and so on and so forth. So a lot of surgeons and doctors might wanna tackle this at the soft tissue level. So they might say, oh, your tonsils are enlarged, let's reduce it. That may not be treating the root cause. Oftentimes doctors will maybe even cut soft tissue that isn't particularly enlarged, but just might be 
in the way but it's not necessarily that these soft tissues are in the way it's really that the skull is has grown too small the airways have skeletally grown too small as well as a couple other possible issues so i think this is really important to keep to mind if you have some sleep disordered breathing and you go to your ent and they start wanting to say i want to chop up all these soft tissues i would be careful i would i don't want to say you should or shouldn't you might have to, it might be good, it might be bad, uh, but I think for the majority of us, we should be very careful because there's a paradigm shift. Everything that I'm explaining to you now is not really widely known in even the most relevant fields. So be aware. So I'm. it sounds like I'm a little bit encouraging skeletal reparations that might be kind of like my path mse and double jaw surgery maybe maybe we should do them a little more than we're doing them now i don't know if i want to say but i wanted to talk about a little bit at least just um how we don't all grow to become equally deformed take a look at these two skulls of people with craniofacial abnormalities here we have someone with uh, an overbite on the left and an underbite on the right. And you can see that it's a lot more differences than simply the distance of the bite. The angle of the jaw, the shape of the jaw, the impaction of the teeth, the bones higher up in the face, the cheekbones, and even their, the posture in their neck, things really change. So when a doctor tells you, oh, we're gonna bring your jaws forward, not every surgeon is going to bring them forward in the same way. And as a patient, I thought that I think that it might be important for you too, so you can make an informed decision. So I wanted to share this uh, one slide, one other slide from Dr. Koppelson, uh, who is a, one of these surgeons. These are the geometric classifications of jaw deformity. So you can have issues with the size of the jaw, the position, the orientation of the jaw, the shape of the jaw, right? The symmetry of the jaw through different views, and then completion being there could be pieces missing or whatever. So these things are all very important in terms of getting the right smile. I have heard a few cases of people who got do double jaw surgery and something wasn't completely corrected exactly, and then it led to all these pains and strains and things have got to be done very precisely. So I'm bound to be forgetting something, but I think that covers it for all the information I wanted to share from the Breathe Institute course. I hope it was helpful. Again, this was 40 hours of lectures and I'm just kind of cutting a couple of the broader concepts that I think are important for everybody to know, not just healthcare professionals. Um, if you have any questions or comments, leave it in the comments below. Hopefully I can answer it, but if not, at least it'll spark a discussion and we can all talk about it together. So take care. Thanks for watching.